podcast from Royal Museum's Greenwich. We're here every week with stories of history and culture, um, the sea and space and history and creativity, all kinds of exciting things with Royal Museum's, Royal Museum's Greenwich curators and special guests. Uh, if they'd like to talk to us, we'd love to hear from you. So if you've got a question or a topic you think we should address, please look for Royal Museum's Greenwich on Facebook, Instagram or Twitter. This week we are talking about hidden nature. Now it's one of the features of lockdown, perhaps one of the silver linings, that everyone started looking a little bit more closely at the world around them and found even in cities that there was quite a lot of nature hidden in plain sight right on their doorstep. Um, now this week uh, Royal Museums Greenwich will join in with the Heritage Open Days which are a national, national festival of uh, culture and history and the main feature will be in a site which is very brilliant but has a very long name which is the Prince Philip Maritime Collection Centre and we'll hear a bit more about that later on but basically uh, that is where lots of conservation goes on there's all kinds of exciting things stashed away in there and this will be part of the Heritage Open Days um, and the theme for Heritage Open Days this week is hidden nature so while we're thinking about nature in that context and some of the not just the nature we all like to watch but perhaps some of it that we're not so keen to see uh, so while we're thinking about all those things we thought this week we would investigate nature more generally in history and culture and especially in the mu museum's collections so we've got three fascinating guests this week to uh, go on that journey with us and we have uh, Maria Bastila Spence who is a preventative conservator at Royal Museums Greenwich. We have Chris Martin who is an exhibitions interpretation curator and we have Louise Devoy who's senior curator at the Royal Observatory. So let's start with the connection that each of you have to this topic. Uh, Louise you can go first. Well, I'm interested in looking at sort of hidden animals in the sky. Um, we often think about different constellations and different patterns. So I'll be thinking about some of those stories today. Fabulous. Uh, Chris, how about you? Well, I've always loved animals and I grew up surrounded by pets. So I've been drawn to animal stories from quite a young age. And I've, my keen interest in animals at sea really comes from a project when I was working at the National Maritime Museum in, early on in my career, when I was looking through historic photographs and I became very curious about the many photographs that were coming up of sailors with animals, not just cats and dogs, but lots of exotic animals. Fabulous. And Maria, how about you? Well, um, my story is a little bit different. As a preventive conservator, I have to look after the damages that some agents of deterioration cause to, to objects. So my passion was objects, but I had to study all those organisms and the specific microorganisms that cause a damage into our collections. Well, we'll be hearing more about those later on, but we're going to set the scene with a reading first of all. And this one is an excerpt from the last book of Charles Darwin. Now, Charles Darwin, you will probably know because of The Voyage of the Beagle and his very famous book on the origin of species by means of natural selection. But you might be less well aware that he was also a very keen observer of nature. That's what he was doing out on the Beagle, after all. Uh, and he wrote about barnacles and coral and worms and all kinds of things. And so this the book his final book was called it has the very brilliant title the formation of vegetable mold through the action of worms with observations on their habits and this excerpt read by simon kane is some of his observations on their habits worms do not possess any sense of hearing they took not the least notice of the shrill notes from a metal whistle which was repeatedly sounded near them nor did they of the deepest and loudest tones of a bassoon. They were indifferent to shouts, if care was taken that the breath did not strike them. When placed on a table close to the keys of a piano, which was played as loudly as possible, they remained perfectly quiet. Although they are indifferent to undulations in the air audible by us, they are extremely sensitive to vibrations in any solid object. When the pots containing two worms which had remained quite indifferent to the sound of the piano were placed on this instrument, and the note C in the bass clef was struck, both instantly retreated into their burrows. After a time they emerged, and when G above the line in the treble clef was struck, they again retreated. Under similar circumstances, on another night, one worm dashed into its burrow on a very high note being struck only once, and the other worm when C in the treble clef was struck. On these occasions the worms were not touching the sides of the pots, which stood in saucers, so that the vibrations before reaching their bodies 
had to pass from the sounding board of the piano, through the saucer, the bottom of the pot, and the damp, not very compact earth, on which they lay, with their tails in their burrows. Now, I love this excerpt, because it's... It's, uh, it's hilarious, but it's also very serious. You know, if you want to find out things, you have to do experiments. And my, of all the mental images in this, my favourite by a long way is the, the mental image of Charles Darwin, the great Charles Darwin, standing in his garden playing the bassoon at a worm. It's just fantastic. Um, so <laughs> that's the thing that, I, that struck me. How about the rest of you? Um, Louise, you can go first. Uh, it, it... Well, it reminded me of how animals are often sensitive to things that we can't quite always perceive. I, I don't know if it's an urban myth or not, but sometimes they talk about animals reacting just before an earthquake or just before a tsunami or something. So really responding to those hidden vibrations. So that's intriguing, definitely. Uh, Chris, how about you? Well, it reminded me of a great visit to Down House in Kent a few years ago, um, where Charles Darwin and his family um, lived. Um, and it's really a plethora of these incredible experiments all dotted around the house that um, Darwin used to undertake these amazing, weird and wonderful things, including trying to charm worms in the garden and, and keeping barnacles on his table and, and, and dissecting things. I mean, it, it's, he's, he's a wonderful hero of mine. <laughs> Uh, brilliant. Whether he was a hero, hero of the worms is another question. Absolutely. Maria, how about you? What, what, what's for you? Well, I think it's interesting how he, he does experiments uh, using sounds. And in a way, like, we try to understand the world as humans, but, you know, like, uh, insects or worms in this case act totally differently. So we will be moving or dancing towards, you know, the sounds of music, but they are totally, like, you know, insensitive to, to, to the sound of the piano. So that's what really strikes to me and how we try to understand the world um, our way, but they definitely have other uh, sensitive uh, parts on their bodies that is really interesting to study too. I think it's going to come up a few times today that humans have a, a tendency to, to put human emotions and, and the sensory experiences onto animals. And it's one of the reasons we discuss animals so much in all the ways we're going to talk about today is that um, we like projecting ourselves onto them, basically. And you can argue about whether or not that's a good idea. Right, well, let's get started with our first object uh, for today. And Chris has this, and it's places you might not explain, expect to find pets. Chris, what have you got to show us? Well, the first thing I'm going to show you is a page from an album from h and Resolution, um, taken around the time of the First World War. And it shows a, a sort of a, a motley crew of dogs and cats that were on board the ship. Um, what's interesting is that we've all heard of dogs and cats kept on ships, um, the tradition of the ship's cat or the ship's dog, and they were mainly kept to um, catch mice and rats. It's clear from a lot of photographs and journals that they were also much loved companions that kept sailors busy and amused during quieter times. What I find interesting is the tradition of taking animals that's to see in the Royal, on Royal Navy ships, it's probably as old as the Royal Navy itself. Um, you may or may not know that the remains of a terrier type dog nicknamed Hatch were recovered from Henry VIII's warship Mary Rose, which sank in 1545, which I think is incredible. Um, these pets often acted as a ship's max mascot. Um, they cemented camaraderie between members of the crew and provided also a sense of normality and relieved boredom and anxiety during long voyages or naval campaigns. And it's this relationship that I find really, really interesting. I'm interested in how animals probably ha held a very important role and um, were very good for the sort of mental health and, and well-being of sailors on board in what was a very stressful and unusual environment. Well, it's very um, striking, isn't it, that the pictures you just showed us, I mean, Frank, they wouldn't be out of place on, on Facebook or Twitter these days, would it? There's, <laughs> it's exactly the same, except they'd be colour images these days. Absolutely. And it wasn't just that there was one on board. There was often several on board and that people would take their own personal pets. So officers would have a cat or a dog that would live with them in their cabin or that they would be allowed to wander around the ship and protect the stores from ships and uh, from um, rats, mice and other pests. So they, they had a really important functional role as well as a very uh, important role in terms of people's well-being. And was it was it encouraged? Because I can see, you know, if everyone brings their own dog, uh, that I can see that being problematic for several reasons. First of all, the dogs have to eat something. Uh, they might not get on with each other. Uh, who's top dog? You know, was, was the, how did the Navy manage all of that? 
I don't think it was necessarily encouraged, um, but I think that there would probably have been an official mascot on board the ship that was shared by the crew, and then it was the um, officer's prerogative if they took their own personal pet with them on board. I mean, they would don't forget they would often have shared the um, the food of the sailors, so anything left over that would be fed to the animals, um, and they were just expected to really get on with one another. And I'm sure there would have been skirmishes all over the place between different cats and dogs that were on board and also the other animals that eventually made their way onto the ships. Now there's a particular cat called Oscar who's quite famous. Tell us about Oscar. Yeah, Oscar is one of the most famous ship's cats. He um, was actually a casualty of war. Um, he was one of the luckiest or maybe unluckiest, depending on your point of view, ship ship's cats. Um, he was actually discovered, it's said that he was discovered floating on a piece of debris in the ocean a few hours after the sinking of the German battleship Bismarck in, in 1941. Um, he was taken on board a ship by HMS Cossack and he was a little black and white cat. He was probably a personal pet of someone who was on Bismarck. He was taken on board the um, Cossack where he was forced to defect to the Royal Navy. Um, he was um, then uh, he was much loved by the crew. He spent a lot of time on, on the ship um, just being allowed to wander around, if you like. Um, sadly, a few months later, the Cossack was also struck by a torpedo and he was again rescued from the sea. He was lucky enough to be rescued and he was transferred onto a ship called Ark Royal, which is an aircraft carrier. Now, a month later, Ark Royal was also struck by a torpedo and yet again, <laughs> Um, he wouldn't want this cat on board. No, exactly. <laughs> Yet again, Oscar, or as he'd been christened by that point, unsinkable Sam, um, was recovered again floating on a piece of debris in the ocean. Now, Oscar was probably seen to be a bad omen for the Navy after that, or maybe they wanted to give him a quieter life, so he was retired to a seaman's rest in Belfast afterwards, and he spent his last years there. But he's, he was... Whether you believe the story or not, some people have questioned it, he was certainly a remarkable cat. And the museum has in its collection the most charming pastel portrait of Oscar that was um, done by Georgina Shaw Baker, um, which shows him floating on the piece of wood that he was found on. It says quite a lot, doesn't it, that people would uh, put the effort into having portrait or pi pictures painted because that wasn't a cheap you know, thing to do if they were that important. It must have, it must have really have mattered. Yeah, Georgina Shawbaker seems to have been a semi-professional artist and she did quite a lot of portraits of infamous or famous dogs and cats that were connected with great um, uh, military events. And do we know, I mean, I, I haven't been on a naval vessel, an active military vessel, but I assume that they don't have cats anymore. Do we know when the, when the pets went away? Yeah, um, in the 1970s and mid-1970s, the orders were issued to all sh ships to, quote, land your warm-blooded animals forthwith. Now, I'm assuming that included anything that was cold-blooded on board as well. Um, and the, it really ended 400 years of the enduring friendship and camaraderie between um, sailors and their, 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 pet, their, their feathered and furred shipmates, if you like. So it was really in the 1970s, really with a fear of disease and rabies was the main cause for it to be outlawed. That's quite late, isn't it? Because I, I mean, when I think about ships on cats, I assume I sort of associate cats with rats and I associate rats with wooden ships because on a steel ship, I mean, it's not that you might not get rats, but there's a, you know, you can't, you can't see them kind of digging into the walls in quite the same way. No, I think by the time the um, metal ships came along, if you like, um, cats were very much about being mascots, about being pets, about, um, camaraderie within the crew they were less about a practical um, form of pest control if you like so by that point they, their, their role had really changed and and I think it was a really important role that they did play. Well I guess I'm sure there are lots of health and safety people who are glad there are no cats anymore but it does seem a little bit sad um, perhaps not for the cats I don't know well when we think about uh, animals in culture it's not just real animals that we think about. They often represent things. And uh, we're going to look next at an example Louise has uh, picked um, an animal from the sky. And as someone who, whose birthday is in November, I am very happy that she's picked Scorpio. Louise, tell us about this object. Okay, so what we have here on the screen is what we call a, a constellation card. So there was a set of cards created in the 1820s. And it's set about 32 cards each one about a little bit bigger than a postcard. And these were designed to be used by parents to teach the patterns of the stars, these constellations to their kids. And what's really great is that you actually have little punch holes 
for each of the stars. And so when you hold up the card to the light, you can see the pattern of the stars shining well, through. On the scorpion we're looking at here, we can see it's got one on its claw and a few on its head and its legs and going down the body. And so all of those would have been a hole that light would shine through. Exactly, yeah. And each hole has been sort of proportioned so that the bigger the hole, the brighter the star in the sky. So it does give you a really good impression of what you'd see. Um, and this is... According to the Greek mythology, this is the story of the scorpion who killed the hunter Orion because Orion had boasted that he could kill any animal. And so, of course, the gods sought their revenge and the scorpion stung him to death. And then as a reminder of that punishment, the, the stars were put in different parts of the sky. So Orion is a winter constellation, whereas Scorpio is a summer constellation. So the two are never in the sky at the same time. That's good. It's good it's distancing. It's like one of the, um, you know, the, all those uh, logic puzzles with the goat and the wolf and the chicken on one side of a river, isn't it? Put them on opposite sides and they can't hurt each other. So how about, I mean, constellations more generally, they're interesting. In a way, we sort of forget, I think, now, because we often can't see the, star, the sky as much. But of the constellations, maybe you've got a better idea. I can think of two types. There are animals and there are mythical characters. Um, what... You know, what sort of what animals do people choose to put in the sky? Where, what, who made that decision? What sort of things are up there? Yeah, you're right. Um, so there's, there's a whole range of animals, some real, some of the mythical, sort of half man, half beast. Um, the oldest constellation is Leo the lion, the king of the beasts. And we've got records that people started envisaging lions in the sky about 6,000 years ago. Um, some of the other animals are smaller, like a a rabbit or a dog, um, I think some of the 18th century ones are a little sort of a flying bee or a wasp. Um, so it's a whole that's optimistic. Whole you can imagine a constellation that's a bee, that's like one yeah. star. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's, and, and people like to choose animals that reflect their surroundings as well. So for the ancient Egyptians, they could see a hippopotamus or a crocodile in the sky, whereas perhaps, say, for the people traveling through the desert, they would see camels instead. So the sky is like a giant mirror. It just reflects our own culture and our own experience. And presumably it varies across cultures, doesn't it? Because, I mean, every cultures from different places and different ages would presumably have looked at the sky and kind of started again with their interpretation of what this one was and what that one was. Do we, does it vary much between cultures? Yes, absolutely. Um, so, for example, uh, for uh, indigenous communities in Australia and New Zealand, they sometimes see the dark spaces between the stars as being more important than the stars themselves. Um, and then equally, when Europeans first started traveling down to the Southern Hemisphere, they created new constellations, but because it was the age of enlightenment and, and reason, they created scientific instruments as their constellations. Oh, really? They I... had the telescope and the microscope and the water pump and so on. So a whole range of different ideas very utilitarian that isn't it in to navigate by the microscope um, <laughs> not nearly as exciting as a centaur or something um, and how about the stories because often it feels like constellations were part it wasn't just a oh there's some, you know the way to remember which way that is is that this constellation the one that looks like a lion is over there but there's, a, there's stories and myths associated with them did did the constellations come first or did the stories come first and then people name the constellations afterwards? Well, that's a great question. I think it's a mixture. Um, some of the stories were already well-known Greek myths and legends that were sort of translated into the patterns in the sky. Um, sometimes there are elements of the story that, that mirror the, the apparent motion of the stars. So for example, if there's a story about punishment, then they usually feature stars that are visible all year round, sort of constantly surfing around the sky as their, as their punishments. So it's, in, it's an interesting mix of sort of science and culture. I'd never thought about um, something like the pole star being there to keep an eye on you. <laughs> but <laughs> fair enough, I guess. If you want to keep people in check, it's always there. And yeah. um, brilliant. Well, let's move on. So, you know, scorpions are fairly, uh, it's perhaps not the friendliest thing to put in the sky, especially if it's about to hunt down something. Um, but there's animals that really cause problems down here on Earth. So let's come to Maria and the carpet beetle. Tell us about the carpet beetle, Maria. Well, carpet beetles are uh, uh, one of the most popular pests that we can find uh, in, in Britain. And 
in the world. Um, so um, the carpet beetle used to eat a lot of protein kind of based materials. And they not only um, are fed from carpets, but they also like to eat uh, wool, feathers, um, skins. So any material uh, based on that, they get got fed from it. So for example, we have in our, in our collection um, um, a skin a cap made from steel skin. And um, it's um, a, one of those objects that uh, had a lot of um, hair on it, but it's lost completely, almost completely, because the carpet beetle just finished with it. And also we can uh, see some holes on it and also is caused by, by, by these um, insects. So they are very small. And the important thing to have in mind is that the ones that cause uh, this damage are not the adults. that are the ones that we usually see, but are the larva. So on beetles, it's important to understand that they have this uh, amazing cycle um, where they start from an egg, uh, then they go through a larva, but they can be on that stage from two months to one year if they have certain conditions around. And at the end, um, they go through a pupa stage that is very short and they, they grow as adults. And adults are the ones that don't cause any damage at all. So this sounds like a real problem. I mean, if you've got to keep all these things safe, and especially I imagine there's lots of organic things in, in the museum's collections, do, do they always get, you know, if you, because I imagine if someone gives you a, a cap, for example, um, it, it probably doesn't have any beetles to start with. Do they, do they move around between things in the collection? Do they come from, where do they come from? How do they find things to eat? Well, usually, for example, this kind of damage that we can see on the, on the object that I was showing before, that was caused in another moment, maybe when they were stored in a place where the beetles could fed from it. But in the museum, we have uh, our conservation centre that you already mentioned, the Prince, <laughs> the Prince Philip Maritime Collection Centre. And we have not only our studios and storage rooms where we um, storage all the objects with the best conditions we can uh, provide, but also we have a quarantine room where we receive the objects and uh, we are really cautious with uh, particularly organic materials and we identify which are the damages they have with the condition they arrive with but also if, if they show any sign of pest infestation and if there are some pests that are present there then we took you know another steps another strategies to control that infestation. So how hard is it to find them? I mean, if there's a big hole, I guess you've got a clue, but how, you know, because I guess if they're larvae, they could be really tiny, hidden away, they could be dormant for a bit. How do you, how do you even find the, the nasties? It's very difficult to find them when they are on that, on that stage. So usually what you find is already the, already the damage or maybe some signs that there was um, the insect uh, growing there. So actually you find the frass, that is the poop uh, from the larva, sorry for it, but I have to use like a more kind of a word that we understand, or you can ha uh, find the, the skin. So um, I have also another picture of uh, the larva stage of the uh, beetle, and you can see how um, the skin, when, when they are growing up on the larva stage, they shed, they, they mold their skin. They are not like us that uh, our skin and bones elongate with us. No, they just, they, they start changing of size and all that skin is left. So are all those kind of um, signs that we go after, but it's very difficult to find the larva. And how specific are they? I mean, this one's a carpet beetle, so I assume it eats things that aren't carpets, but it probably, you know, the, clearly carpets are in its sights. But then does a carpet beetle, would that go after something of leather, for example? Are, are the pests very, very specific or are they, can they cause problems in a few different areas? 
Uh, we have uh, beetles that maybe are called actually after the things that they are more attracted to. But beetles, uh, we have, for example, another beetles that I'm going to show on our second part, that they can be fed uh, from wood, for example. Or, for example, moths, they also can eat, for example, protein. So we divided them more like in three categories of pests um, uh, to do any uh, pest control or monitoring. And uh, so we have a starch uh, eating pests or pests that are attracted more to starch, like it's, uh, wood or um, uh, vegetable dried materials or food based materials. And then we have the ones that get fed from. Um, the protein kind of materials as wool, as for example, taxidermy collections, ethnographic collections. Um, and then we have some ones uh, that live more in humid kind of um, environments. So are those silver fish that we find sometimes uh, under the tiles on our um, uh, bathrooms, you know? So those kind of uh, uh, insects show us that there's a problem, a humid problem near in our a house or in our interiors yeah and just very briefly how do you get to do a job like this i mean it's not like there's an a level in in museum pests how did you end uh, up where you are? <laughs> no actually you you get a, a really kind of basic knowledge when you are uh, studying conservation you just get to know that there are some damages caused uh, by insects but then uh, through your career you start just learning <laughs> and taking specific courses related with it. And we have to use a lot of um, aids, you know, visual aids. So we use a lot of microscopes or maybe these, for example, uh, you know, magnifying tools uh, just to see them uh, better. But actually we also use, for example, to monitor them and, and find them. We use, for example, sticky traps. So these ones have a, a sticky part on it and we put it on the floor near to doors or windows and they can stick to it, especially the adults more than the larva. But we have larva. Those uh, photographs I'm showing are uh, larvas that uh, we find on those traps. And also, for example, moths. Uh, we use some lure traps. And oh, it's actually got moths on it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so you uh, want to just count how many of them do you have in a trap? And when the, the, the number is really, it's really high is when you are really worried about it. But it's, it's really typical to found, find these in your house, in any uh, historical house. Less in museums because we have now uh, a better control, uh, you know, we control better our environmental conditions. Um, so we really kind of... Um, Yes, yeah, we are on top of it, we'll, and we we'll are doing back. all our program. <laughs> we'll yeah. come back to some of the things that the museum can do. But uh, now, it's just, so if anyone out there had wanted to work out, wanted to know how to work in the conservation pests, there you go. Um, but for those who are joining us late, this is Ships, Sea and the Stars from Royal Museums Greenwich, and this week we're talking about hidden nature with curators Chris Martin, Maria Bastilda Spence, and Louise Du Bois. Now we're going to start the second half uh, with a poem about animals. Now, I asked Twitter for um, recommendations for people's favourite animal poems and the list that came back was astonishing and very funny in a lot of cases. A lot of good po comic poetry has been written about animals. Um, so this was just one of many suggestions. I highly recommend going back to find that tweet and all the suggestions. But it was suggested by um, Abby Jones and it was written, it's a poem by A.A. A. Milne who wrote a lot of children's poetry in addition to to the Winnie the Pooh books um, and it's this poem I love this as a kid and I still think it's brilliant today it's called The Four Friends and it's read by Simon Cain. The Four Friends. Ernest was an elephant a great big fellow. Leonard was a lion with a six foot tail. George was a goat and his beard was yellow and James was a very small snail. Leonard had a stall and a great big strong one. Ernest had a manger and its walls were thick. George found a pen, but I think it was the wrong one, and James sat down on a brick. Ernest started trumpeting and cracked his manger. Leonard started roaring and shivered his stall. James gave a huffle of a snail in danger, and nobody heard him at all. Ernest started trumpeting and raised such a rumpus. Leonard started roaring and trying to kick. James went on a journey with the goat's new compass, and he reached the end of his brick. Ernest was an elephant and very well-intentioned. Leonard was a lion with a brave new tail. George was a goat, as I think I have mentioned, but James was only a snail. 
I love that poem. Everyone loves James the snail best of all because it it really highlights how we use animals to represent different characteristics uh, in humans. But basically, everyone loves James because he's just quiet and getting on with it. Didn't make a big fuss. Just got to the end of his brick. So um, let's go back to animals uh, in history and culture and. We are going to go back to animals on ships and Chris has a slightly more exotic ship's pet for us. Uh, Chris, tell us about Trotsky. Okay, so as, on, as well as cats and dogs that are often found on ships, there are some more exotic and, and unusual and potentially dangerous animals that are also took, taken on board ships. And they included things like monkeys, parrots, foxes, donkeys, snakes, wallabies, and even bears. And there's two very good examples of, of bears that were taken on board Royal Naval ships. This is Trotsky. Uh, Trotsky was a gift to the crew of HMS Ajax in 1919-1920 um, in, uh, during the Russian campaign. He was a two-month-old brown bear and he was taken on board um, as a gift, as I said, and he was really given free range to, of, of the ship. He was allowed to wander around, he slept with the crew, he ate with the crew, he used to like to swim in the ocean when the ship was at anchor. So he was a real sort of um, mascot, if you like, for, for the crew on board the ship. And, and, and he, he, he seemed to have had a great time, although I think life must have been quite unpleasant for him. Um, sadly, his um, freedom was his undoing because he came to a, a very sad end because he, he, he had a very short career at sea and he was mistaken for a wild bear by a sentry who unfortunately shot him dead and didn't realise that he was tame and he was also had an important naval role. So sadly, he, he was only with the crew for a little while. There's also a really good example of a polar bear that was picked up um, near Green Greenland, um, Barbara the polar bear, Barbara she became known, um, Barbara was found floating as a cub on, a, on, a, on an ice drift and, and was rescued, if you like, by the crew, uh, was taken on board, again given free range of the ship, she quick, very quickly outgrew the ship and she would have posed a, a real danger to the crew as she got older and so she was retired to a naval zoo on Whale Island in, um, in Portsmouth and this was a naval zoo that became a, a refuge for a lot of dangerous or, or a lot of animals animals that outstayed and outgrew their welcome on ships and became a, a place that you could visit as a sailor that was full of things like flamingos and monkeys and bears and lions even that had all been picked up by naval, naval ships. Um, so I mean it, it just goes to show that no animals were out of the equation when it came to taking animals on board ship and some of them were, would have been incredibly dangerous as they got older. I can see not wanting to have a bear grow to full anywhere near full, you know, an adulthood. Um, so what, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? That, that when people, we, we, you know, we are looking at this with modern eyes. It's very hard to look at that picture of the polar bear with the bars without thinking with modern animal welfare, you know, at the forefront of the mind. Was, was there any discussion of that then or was it just a harder time and there was no sentimentality about you know cooping animals up or putting collars on wild animals that kind of thing i don't think we were as um sensitive to that as we are possibly today i think what was often the case was they were seen as exotic curiosities and playthings and companions that could be taken on board and had fun with um a lot of the time they were um, mascots that were given things like collars, as you say, coats and badges to dress up in. They were taught tricks. Um, they were there to sort of uh, entertain, if you like. I mean, it must, there must have been times when they were very bored, very um, uh, needed something to do, and the animals were a way of bringing them together and giving them something to do on board the ship. I mean, many animals, like cats and dogs, for instance, were taken on board um, uh, from home ports as sort of either smuggled pets or as, um, as official mascots but certain animals like the polar bear for instance they were sometimes um, taken on board as exotic souvenirs during the voyages or they were ambassadorial gifts or they were casualties of war that, or casualties that were, were saved if you like and taken on board as a way of saving that animal. It's an interesting contrast to the, you know, as we've talked about in previous weeks, in we tend to associate um, life at sea with very rigid, very rule bound, very strict times of where you can go and, you know, you're allowed in some places and not in others. And it seems the animals just kind of broke through all of that. They could go wherever they wanted and um, they were sort of leveling in a way. Is, is that fair? 
Yeah, I think that's fair. And I think it also gave a sense of normality, if you like. Having pets, not so much with exotic animals, but having cats and dogs on board, it was sort of a normal part of life to own pets and to enjoy your pets. I think that was what uh, was so important about them. But it was also that they were a morale booster. Having them there was a way to bring people together. It was fun. It was outside of the rigours of the, of the norm of life in the Royal Navy, if you like. They were there just to have fun and to, to relieve anxiety and stress as well. And we've all found over the last few weeks how important our pets have been to relieving our anxiety and our stress during lockdown and the problems that we're going through at the moment so I think that has a nice parallel with how animals were treated in the Navy. Well there is I think there's research now that shows people who are you know own dogs and cats are less less stressed in general uh, so it, apparently it really does work uh, whether it's less stressful for the dog or the cat is another thing. <laughs> Okay, let's move on from uh, bears on ships to bears in the sky, because Louise has got another bear for us. Show us this one, Louise. So this is another constellation card that shows the constellation Ursa Major, the big bear. And according to Greek mythology, this was the bear Callisto put up into the sky. And unlike Trotsky, this poor bear wasn't allowed to bathe in the sea. Um, so because these stars are visible all year round, they're, they're what we call circumpolar stars, they always move around the pole. They're always above the horizon, uh, even during the day. We just can't see them because of the sun's glare. So interesting, again, how the, the story and the science has sort of been merged together with the, the bear never going below the horizon or never going into the sea, as seen in Greece. Um, I have to so say, it's a bit of a stretch, this one. If you look at the stars and you look at the outline of a bear, it, it, it doesn't look... Maybe, this, maybe it's the artwork, but I would say... There's as many stars outside that bear as there are inside it. You know, it doesn't. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I agree. I think a lot of the constellations are really tricky. They're, you have to really use your imagination to see them, and I, I guess that's part of the appeal of these cards is that you can really do that. Um, we're probably more familiar with the the brighter stars along the top, and um, this is traditionally known as the plow, so named after the um, agricultural implement. Um, but if you want a more modern take, I like to think of it either as a saucepan or even as a shopping trolley. So uh, whatever shape resonates best with your life experience, I guess. Oh, it is, I guess that's the test, is it look into the sky and what do you see? And what have different cultures seen? Because I mean, uh, the same, because I guess it's quite obvious, most people would agree if you look into the sky, there's a sort of clump here, there's something that we can give a name to here. How about, um, so I think in Chinese mythology, these stars represented something quite different. Yeah, so uh, in Chinese mythology, this was a, a coffin um, and it was sort of followed through the sky by these um, bright stars that were effectively the daughters of the deceased man. And the man himself was actually killed by someone represented by the pole star Polaris. So you've got the coffin and daughters constantly circling around the murderer as a sort of, uh, as a punishment. It's, it's a really nice idea, isn't it, to sort of use the, use the physicality of it as a way of reliving the story mm -hmm. i mean I, and i guess perhaps this is something that, that we've lost a little bit now in our days of multimedia everything and tv and cinema but that sense of earlier civilizations being surrounded by living in the stories that it wasn't that it was separate to life it was that you lived in a world where the hunt you know the hunter was in the center and the you know the the hearse was going around the sky effectively um, is that something that's quite, I mean, what do you think, because we're sort of losing constellations a little bit, I feel that perhaps, I mean, the, the plough, as you mentioned, is possibly more better known than the, the, the bear version of that. But are we, do you think we're in danger of forgetting that constellations are a thing? Possibly. Um, I think it depends. I mean, in some ways, yes, from a technical point of view, we can assign coordinates to stars so we can very precisely map where they are, we can use computer programs. But certainly for, for people who just want to look up at the sky, it's, it's nice to see these patterns. And for me personally, I like to see some of these constellations throughout the year. So, so for example, when Orion and the hunting dogs are visible, I know it's November, the evening's getting dark. There's almost that excitement because it's coming up to Christmas. And then again, in the summer, you see you're, you're, they're almost like friends who come back throughout the course of the year, reminding you of that the Earth's journey through space. And it's something that I definitely associate with, you know, spending time in the Southern Hemisphere when the stars look different. It mm. is, it's very disconcerting. Even if you think you don't look at the stars very much, it's very weird mm. when they're not the ones you expect. You know, seeing the Southern Cross, yeah. we, you know, I never saw growing up. It's, it's very odd. 
And how do you, when people, I mean, presumably at the observatory now, you're sort of teaching people constellations as well. It's, it's a fun thing for kids to do, isn't it? To recognise things. Yeah, great. I mean, you can start with the pole star, go down to the plough, and then you can sort of jump off and use it as a signpost to find other constellations. Um, and then, the, like everything, the, the more you look, the more you can see. So you can then start to notice that maybe some stars are brighter than others. Maybe some stars have different colours, might be a slightly blue tinge or a red tinge. Um, and that's when you really start to sort of ask questions. So it's a great starting off point. Brilliant. Well, let's move down from the lofty heights of the sky to some more mundane problems. Uh, well, back to some of Maria's professional problems, actually. Maria has a different type of beetle. You mentioned it before. It's the furniture beetle. Tell us about this one. Well, this one is quite similar to the um, carpet beetle. And uh, I want to highlight that to me uh, as I start getting trained into identify pests that is one of the main uh, activities we do uh, when we are doing um, uh, insect pest management and um, so um, is that this one uh, has a lighter uh, head for saying a weight compared to the other one and this one um, it's um, wood instead of eating uh, carpet or wool or you know like the protein materials this one it uh, starch materials and as we are seeing here this is a um, frame from a painting of the 19th century and we can see all the damage that they can cause and they are more even difficult to find um, in the object causing any damage because what adults do the females they lay their um, eggs in any uh, kind of crack they can they can find um, in the object or even in all the holes left by adults when they go um, out when um, so are those holes that you saw just on that on that picture and they almost they can destroy an entire uh, wooden floor or uh, uh, you know like it's not it's not only a furniture but the interior of house that we have very uh, old houses as historical houses they can suffer a lot from this uh, damage and how long does it take i mean these are very tiny insects but presumably if they reproduce quickly they could cause a lot of damage very quickly or does it just take does it take decades for the for it to become apparent it's just that sometimes they can uh, be uh, you know uh, inside of the of, of a wooden object from five to seven years eating the object from inside and, and because you are not seeing it because they are totally hidden underneath so they are going to keep eating eating and just forming this kind of caverns inside and sometimes you just notice when you just hold the object on your hands and then um, they leave like a, a very uh, light and thin um, like you know lay outside and it can just crack on your on your fingers that's that's the thing they they can live there for for many years as larvae. so if you know they're in there what can you do about them because obviously cleaning the outside isn't going to help very much what do you do to yeah. get them out of the inside so uh, we have different treatments um one interesting treatment that we can do for example is freezing objects uh, but it has to be controlled and it has to be under center con certain conditions. So temperature must be under um, min minus 30 or minus 20. So you have to use a big freezer or walk-in freezers to put up furniture piece inside. Or for example, you can also inject some kind of insecticide or product that maybe can just kill them. Or there are new um, kind of treatments that we are using in the preventive um, or a conservation world that is, for example, anoxia. I don't know if it's, this is the name that we use. And uh, so you just um, take oxygen out of the you atmosphere. basically suffocate them. Exactly. We suffocate the, the insect until they stop uh, their organic, uh, you know. Um, Stopped causing problems. Well, let's, exactly. just, let's use that as a, a jumping off point to get to the Prince Philip Maritime Collection Centre, because this is, um, you know, when I... Uh, came back to live in London and I, I knew about the four main sites of the museum, uh, the National Maritime Museum, the Queen's House, the Cutty Sark uh, and the Royal Observatory. And then it turns out that just over the hill around the back, there is this collection centre and this is where all the conservation happens. But the brilliant thing is the public can go in and see it. Tell us a little bit about that. 
Yeah, well, uh, the, this, this century actually is very new, uh, as you say, like before we were just having the, the other sites. So the, this is a little bit new, even though we had storages, but they were, we, we had our collections based there, but we built up this uh, new building in 2018, if I'm not wrong, um, we opened it um, and we started bringing a uh, public um, around 2019. Um, and uh, what we do is um, giving them uh, people, they have to book obviously as lot and just to come, uh, also schools come, um, and uh, we show uh, the behind the scenes of our work as conservators. So they walk around the storages also, they see objects that they don't see usually on the exhibition, and, and they see also our conservators working live uh, with objects and uh, we have uh, a textile studio, paper studio, paintings one, uh, uh, frames one, so uh, we have different um, studios there, the objects one, so um, different things are happening. There is in, in the loads to see. So for, for an, uh, I don't know if it's open for visitors again yet, I'm not sure, but if you ever do get the chance to go, the most amazing thing about it is these drawers and the curators that pull open these drawers and they have the most amazing collection of things and they pull out the drawer above and it's got a whole different section of things. Anyway, so um, we are almost out of time. Uh, I have one final question for each of you, just very briefly, which is if you could pick one animal you'd like to see more or less of, so that's either your most favourite or least favourite creature, what would it be that we should see more or less of? Uh, Chris, you can go first. Well, my animal has already been mentioned by Louise briefly, but it's got to be the hippopotamus. I'm, I'm, I've always been obsessed with hippopotamus, especially the pygmy hippopotamus, so I'd like to see more hippopotamuses out there. Excellent. Uh, Louise? Um, I think I'll probably go for the otter. Um, I was reading recently about how otters are being reintroduced into the West Country and whereas previously they might have been seen as a bit of a nuisance, they're actually now part of our weaponry to, to fight against climate change and flooding, with the constructions of their, their dams and rivers and stuff like that. So it's interesting how this sort of villain has now become a hero. And they are definitely generally hidden. Um, and Maria, how about you? Well, I'm going to talk about like the the one that I like the less, and unfortunately, it's also an insect. And I l lived in Colombia most of my life, and I lived in a city uh, that was really warm, and um, I found a lot of cockroaches around, and it was very difficult to control them, and I really hate them. They are just close to me and I start running away from them and I, I my, you know, like my hairs on my, <laughs> on my arms really start like it was too cute maybe. It's yeah. the sound, it's isn't horrible. It? The sound they make, the sort of rustling noise. When yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> it's hard to find anyone who really likes a cockroach. Most, most animals, there's at least somebody, but cockroaches, it's pretty tough. If that's you out there in the audience, do let us know uh, and let us know why. Right, well, we have reached the end of our time for today. Uh, just as a reminder, this week's episode is highlighting the Heritage Open Days. Um, as Maria was saying, there are lots of things going on at the Prince Philip Maritimes Collection Centre on the theme of hidden nature. So do go along to rmg.co.uk slash heritage open days, all one word, uh, to have a look for all the online things that are happening there. And all the Royal Museum's Greenwich sites are now open. So you can go and look at all the things we've been talking about in this series. Uh, entry is still free. You just need to book online ahead of time and you can find all the details on the website. And this is the final episode of our second series of Ship, Sea and the Stars. We'll be keeping you up to date on what happens next. Uh, so do follow Royal Museum's Greenwich on Facebook, Instagram or Twitter. Keep an eye on the website. And it only remains for me to thank our three fabulous contributors this week uh, Chris Martin, Maria Bastilda Spence and Louise Devoy. Thank you to Simon Kane for the readings, to Steve Thompson for the music. I'm Helen Cheresky, um, Sean Gill, <laughs> I've done it again, Sean was our producer this week um, and yeah take care of yourselves until we're back or there are more exciting War Museums Greenwich online events. Thank you and bye. <laughs>